Okay. So um, I would like to open my shiro, my limud, by noting two general characteristics uh, of the book of Estelle. Uh, the first is the impressive symmetrical structure of, I'm sorry, okay, now you can see that, symmetrical structure of the book. The book is clearly divided into two parts, each with a number of parallel components arranged in a chiastic structure. You can see this on the slide. For example, the first element in the first part, in part one, is parallel with the last element uh, in the second part, in part two, A, A, one, B, B, one, C, C, one, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this symmetrical structure highlights the central component, right, obviously, which is positioned at the center of the, of the book with no parallel. The episode describing the night when the king could not sleep, which ends with Mordechai receiving the, the, the honor of riding the king's horse. So the placement of this episode at the center of the book indicate its significance, right? But a second central characteristic of the book raises questions regarding the function and the significance of this incident. So this characteristic is the tight plot sequence of the story. The Megillah comprises a sequence of interlinked events. Each and every one of these events contributes to the unfolding plot of the rescue of Persian Jewry from destruction. For example, you can see this on the slide. Vashti's ex expulsion in the first feast, uh, you can read this, Vashti is never again to come before the king, right? Um, this leads to a search for another queen who can replace her and serves as the motivation for Esther's arrival in the king's palace, which will ultimately lead to saving the nation. Another example, a good example for that, is the episode of Biktan and Teresh, who had plotted to murder the king, right? Mordechai overheard them scheming and alerted the king, and thus his life was saved. Well, the significance of this episode is only clarified later when in the incident of the king's horse, when the king, when a sleep, I'm sorry, evades the king. He asks for the book of records, Sefer Hazichronot, and is reminded of the foiled plot against him, which leads him to reward Mordechai for his loyalty by having him ride the king's horse through the city. I know it's a little bit long, but I think um, we will read the verses uh, because this is our main interest uh, in the discuss discussion. So I think uh, we'll read it together. So um, on that night, it's chapter six, Esther chapter, chapter six. On that night, the king could not sleep and he gave orders to bring the book of records, the annals, and they were read to the king. It was found written how Mordechai had told about Biktan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, I, I hope I pronounced correct. No, yes. Who guarded the threshold and who had conspired to assassinate King Hashverosh. Then the king said, What honor or distinction has been bestowed on Mordechai for this? The king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. The king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordechai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So the king's servants told him, Haman is there, standing in the court. The king said, let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said to him, what shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor? Haman said to himself, whom would be uh, the king wished to honor more than me? Who would, I'm sorry, who would the king wish to honor more than me? So Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king wishes to honor, let royal robes be ro brought, which the king has worn, and a horse that the king had read has ridden, with a royal crown on its head. Let the robes and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let him rob the man whom the king wishes to honor, and let him conduct the man on horseback through the open square of the city, proclaiming before him, Thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Then the king said to Haman quickly, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to 
to the Jew Mordechai, who sits at the king's gate. Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse and robbed Mordechai and led him riding through the open square of the city, proclaiming, thus shall it be done for the men whom the king wishes to honor. So the incident of uh, the king's horse, I'm sorry, I just want to come back to the zoom. Uh, the incident of the king's horse clarifies very clearly the ep episode involving Miktan and Telesh. But the details seems to, seem to lack any real contribution to the plot. What is the function of this incident within the narrative sequence? I, I want to briefly review the sequence of, um, of, um, of events in the book in order to clarify this uh, question. After Esther, that, this is a very quick uh, review. After Esther is placed to, on the throne, the king elevates Haman's status and order all to bow down to him. Mordechai refuses to bow to Haman, as you probably remember, and as a result, Haman issues a decree to massacre all Jews in the kingdom, to which the king agrees. Mordechai convinces Esther to approach the king in order to fight the king's decree. Uh, the king's decree, I'm sorry, to destroy the Jewish people. Initially, Esther refuses. But later, she is convinced and ventures before the king. She invites the king and Haman to a feast. At the feast, she requests that they join her for a second feast planned for the following night. Let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I will prepare for him. Uh, come tomorrow to the banquet that I will prepare for him. The incident of the king's horse is positioned between Esther's two fists. In fact, it disrupts the plot sequence. Uh, omitting this episode altogether would not change the story in any way. If we imagine for a moment the story continuing from the point of departure after the first feast of Esther, with the king and Haman arriving at Esther's second feast, the story would be in perfect order. What then is the purpose and meaning of the incident of the horse, which, is, which on the one hand is placed at the center of the book, but on the other hand disturbs the sequence and seems to contribute nothing to the plot? In other words, our main discussion here is the significance and the function of the horse incident in the book of Esther. And my suggestion, my thesis is that even though the episode seems to have no function in the narrative, in fact, it is the turning point of the entire story and embodies the central ideological ideas of the book. And in order to convince you, I hope I will convince you, we first need to understand Esther's plan, what the purpose was of inviting the king and Haman to two different feasts. What was Esther trying to achieve? That, that we have to understand that in order to, to answer the question. So we have to remember first that Mordechai has asked Esther to plead for her people before the king, but never made a concrete suggestion how she should approach him. I'm reading on uh, chapter four. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all other Jews. If you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance, deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. So he, he doesn't suggest anything concrete. He, he just um, asking her to, to go to, the, to, to approach the king. And Esther had to come up with a plan to persuade the king to reverse his edict. In the first time, she invited the king and Haman to a feast. If it please, 
pleases the king, let the king and a man come today to a banquet that I have prepared for the king. Inviting the king for, to a feast may be understood on the, back, on the background of Persian governance culture, according to which feasts were the customary setting for petitioning the king. By the way, the, the, the words of, um, of Rabbi Galinkin are a little bit connected to that because of um, the little historical evidence we have. We don't have a lot of evidence, but the, the, the evidence we have uh, definitely uh, show uh, something about the motif of drunk, drinking in the, Persians, the Persian uh, kingdom. That was a very important motif in, in, in this kingdom. So setting the, the, the uh, under, um, I'm sorry, um, inviting, inviting uh, 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 the king to a feast is very much uh, understandable. But why does Esther invite Haman to the feast? This detail is especially surprising considering the seeming, seemingly intimacy of Esther's invitation in contrast with the public affairs of chapters one to two. To invite another man to this intimate event between the queen and her husband, the king, seems unfitting, right? So this surprise seems to be part of Esther's plan and its function is unknown at this stage, except to cause the king pose and surprise him with this detail. The first fist, oh, I'm sorry, the fist is, yeah, the first fist itself is uneventful. Esther says nothing of the edict against the Jews, which is the reason for the fist. As the fist, at the fist, Esther does not appeal to the king. Instead, she invites the king and Haman to yet another fist. Let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet that I will prepare for them. So what is Esther's plan? And I just want to say that some argue that Esther has no plan <laughs> and that she invites uh, the king to feast after feast just to only to gain time. But I disagree. <laughs> and I think, I believe that Esther has a well-calculated plan and that inviting Haman to the feast is an essential part of that plan. In order to understand her strategy, we need to recall Haman's position and status in the kingdom. Haman is uh, the king's highest minister and closest advisor. Uh, this is chapter two. Gidal HaMelech HaChashverosh et Haman ben Hamdata. King HaChashverosh promoted Haman. Vayenaseu vayasem et kiso me'al kol asarim asherito. Advanced him and set his seat above all the officials who war with him. So um, in addition to his primary position, which is one problem, Haman's influence over the king is absolute. We can see this on the um, occasion where uh, Haman is uh, cast the poor. He is so confident in his power that he cast the poor before receiving a prohibition. They cast poor before Haman. That was before he approaches the king. And moreover, Haman's idea to destroy the entire nation is accepted by the king and Conditionally, uh, I read just few verses here. If it pleases the king, if tov, let a decree be issued for their destruction. Ikatev leabdam, and and later on, and verse ten. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman. Vayasar melech et abato me'al yado veitna lehaman. And uh, the king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people as well to do with them as it seems to be, as it seems good to you. So Esther understands 
a man's power. She knows that she cannot petition the king from the weakened position of arguing against an addict that was a man's initiative. As Esther told Mordechai, giving the wrong move, the king could put her to death. So she knows, she's very smart, and she knows that she needs to think of a way to weaken a man's position and break the king's unequivocal trust. She understands that the only way to quash the edict is to spark a dispute between Ahasuerus and Haman by driving a wedge between him and the king. How could this be accomplished? How could you do that? So since I, ideologically the king and Amman are united, Esther has to create a divide between them and the personal plane. Esther needs to create plausible suspicion against Haman by inserting a personal source of tension. It seems that her plan is to raise the king's suspicion that Haman covets Esther and not only sexually, but as a means toward overtaking the kingdom. Coveting the king's wife is in itself an attempt to challenge the king's position and authority. Um, I can give you one, uh, one, I would say a good example, one example, biblical example, of undermining the king by overtaking his queen or his concubine. This is, uh, uh, it's written on 2 Samuel 16, uh, which describes Achitophel's advice to Abshalom. Chitophel suggested of Shalom, and I hope you remember, that David's concubine be, concubines be brought to him in order to enhance and demonstrate his power. So if the king Achashverosh were to believe that there was a romantic relationship between Esther and Haman, he might deduce that Haman is coveting not only the queen, but the kingship itself. Then Esther can use this betrayal to quash the edict. The text doesn't describe, right, unfortunately, what happened at the first fist, but we can imagine, we can imagine that Esther uses uh, her feminine charm. She sat beside a man and was friendly enough to make the king jealous. So this is the moment to remind ourselves that the king, king's relationship with Esther is different than the relationship with his concubine because uh, it is based on love. The king loved Esther more than all the other women. And of course, love breeds jealousy. As we read in Song of Songs, For love is strong as death and jealousy fierce as the grave. So Haman was probably flattered and left the fist happy and in high spirit. Sameach v'tov lev. On the other hand, the king could not sleep that night. And he has the book of records, Sefer Hazichonot, brought before him where he reads the section on uprising against the king. The incident, incident I'm sorry, of the king's horse should be read on the background of the king's paranoia and concern about Haman's behavior. The king is still anxious about the first fist and Esther had already invited Haman and him to another fist. Sleep evades the king and in his book of records, he reads about a plot from the, from the past. When the king asks who is in the courtyard, mi bechatzer, his paranoia is apparent. When he discovers that Haman is locking. This rouses his suspicion that Haman is plotting against him. This gap between the gap and Ham between the king and Haman is expressed in their discussion. And that and the king said to him, "What shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor? Ma laasot ba'ish asher amelech afetz biikarot? Why doesn't the king simply tell Haman whom he wishes to honor? The king deliberately." hides the identity of the one who wish, he, he wishes to reward. Once Estelle wisely planted, uh, planted seeds of paranoia against Haman, the king no longer trusts him. Moreover, Haman's response intensifies the king's fear. What does Haman suggest? 
אשר לבש בו המלך. וסוס אשר רכב המלך, ואשר נתן כתר מלכות, I'm sorry, כתר מלכות בראשו, the royal, rob, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse that the king has ridden, with a royal crown on its head. A man advises the king to dress the one he wishes to honor in symbolic royalty, essentially providing him with temporary kingship. The significance of Haman's suggestion affirms the king's suspicion that Haman wants to replace him as king. This assumption sheds light on the incident of the king's horse. Esther had planted suspicion against Haman in the first fist, and Haman's suggestion involving riding the king's horse in royal garb affirms the king's suspicion. He can see with his own eyes that Haman covets his power, and seek the opportunity to step into the king's shoes. As a re uh, reaction, the king is instructs a man to do all that he had suggested to Mordechai. Sending a man himself, think about it, instead of another servant, sends a clear message of humility to a man. Instead of becoming king, he will be no more than the servant who dresses and leads the one whom the king wishes to honor. Um, so I think that the incident of the horse, of the king's horse, where, when the night, where um, in chapter six, in the middle, in the, in the center, at the center of the book, enhances the animosity between Achashverosh and Aman and help, helps Estelle realize her plan. The following day, the king will arrive at the feast, assuming Haman is dangerous and subversive and will therefore be more easily convinced by Esther. This is reinforced by Esther's dialogue with the king in the second fist. Um, the king, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. The king Achashverosh said to Esther, who is he? And where is he who has presumed to do this? And Esther says, a foreign enemy, this wicked Haman, Haman Hara Haze. Despite the fact that the king signed Haman's edict, He claimed to know nothing of his own decree, right? This is a very, it's a big problem in the Megillah. And I, I'm sorry for the, in this moment, I cannot relate to this problem. But anyway, he, he claims that he, he know nothing about, uh, about the edict and is immediately convinced by Esther's plea. Esther's strategy uh, seems to proceed as planned since Saman falls on Esther's bed, bed to beg her for compassion and the king's interprets Haman's action as an attempt to conquer the queen. I will read only let's, just a few verses. Um, Ve'hamelech, it's verse 8. Ha'melech shav miginat habitan el beit mishteh hayayin, ve'haman nofel al amita asher ester alea, ve'yomer ha'melech, ha'gam lichbosh et ha'malkai mi babayit. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman had thrown himself on the couch where Estelle was uh, reclining, and the king said, will he ever assault the queen in my presen presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered him. This completes Esther's wise and calculated plan. She drove a wedge between Haman and the king, which enabled her to slip in and petition for her people. According to this interpretation, the incident of the king's horse is the turning point of the plot since it's critical to the realization of Esther's plan. And of course, there was no way for Esther to orchestrate the incident of the horse. She could not have programmed the opening of the book of records uh, uh, to the episode of Biktan and Teresh. She could not have planned Haman's arrival in the king's court at exactly the right moment. And these details are working of divine providence, which is concealed in the Megillah, Hashgacha Nisteret. Thus the horse incident illust illustrates the ideological principle, the root of the story. God acts behind the scenes, me'achorea kleim. This principle is expressed in the rabbinic uh, uh, concept of creating a cure before the blow, before the people even know the, uh, what's going on and without the people seeing uh, 
uh, the hand of God. And this is written in Masechet Megillah, אחר הדברים האלה, אמר רבא, אחר ש... רבא, I'm sorry, אחר שברא הקדוש ברוך הוא רפואה למכה, after these events, uh, after what particular events, רבא said, only after the Holy One blessed he, be he created a remedy for the blow. Actually, the entire book of Esther is constructed on this principle. The significance of many events in the book is unclear at the first glance. You cannot understand what they mean. And only as the plot develops, it becomes apparent that their purpose was to precede remedy to the blow, like team Refu'alamaka, to help the people behind the scene. Additionally, the incident of the king's horse function in another way. It demonstrates another deep message of the book, the message of reversal, v'nahafohu. As we saw earlier uh, on this, exactly the same slide, the horse episode is at the very center of the book, between the first part of the story, which describes the deterioration toward the massacre of the Jews, and the second part, which explains how the massacre was prevented and the Jews were saved. The incident of the king's horse is the moment of change. It illustrates the reversal of fates symbolized by the start of Haman's fall and the beginning of Mordechai's rise. When the king consults Haman how he should repay the one he wishes to honor, this is Haman's highest point, the peak of his meteoric ascent to power to a position of absolute influence on the king. In this moment, Haman visualizes himself as a king, wearing royal clothes and riding the king's horse. He envisions himself as achieving the highest, the height of success, perhaps becoming king himself. But instead of riding the king's horse, he is condemned to bestowing this honor upon the, his biggest enemy, Mordechai, the Jew, who will not bow to him. And the higher he rose, the harder he will fall. From this point forward, Haman deteriorates rapidly. First, he is forced to honor Mordechai, leading him as he rides the king's horse. Next, he returns to his home with a bowed head, and his family greets him with his, the realization that his fate has turned. If Mordechai, before whom your downfall has begun, is of the Jewish people. You will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Im mizera ha-Yehudi Mordechai asher ha-chilot al-impol lefanav lo tuchalo ki nafol tipol lefanav. Before he has the chance to digest this message, he is hastily led to Esther's fist. The verse emphasizes that he is led passively Another sign of the rapid deterioration of his position, the Sarisa Melech Gil, Vayavhilu Lehavi et Haman. The king's and, uh, eunuchs arrived and hurried the man off to the banquet that Esther had prepared. At the feast, Esther accuse, ac accuses him of plotting uh, uh, to destroy her people, and his demise is represented in his actions. Haman Nofel al Hamita, a man was falling upon the bed. Lastly, the king puts the final nail in Haman's coffin. They hanged a man on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordechai. Veitlu et Haman al etz asherichin le Mordechai. Meanwhile, at the same time, Mordechai undergoes a reverse process. By the time the inadvertent honor is bestowed upon him, he reaches the absolutely lowest point. He's wearing sackcloth, sack in anticipation, in anticipation of the demise of his nation, while the gallows created for him his own hanging stands waiting. In a reversed process, Mordechai first rides the king's horse, is then put in charge of a man's house and received the king's ring. Vaitna le Mordechai. The king took off his ring, uh, uh, ring, which he has taken, had taken for a man, and gave it to Mordechai. Later, he rises even higher. Mordechai, Atzamil, Fnei Melech, Bilvush, 
מלכות. מרדכי went out from the presence of the king wearing royal robes of blue and white, etc. All the glory Haman had envisioned coming to him is now bestowed upon Mordechai. So the incident of the king, the king's horse, symbolizes this reversal. This moment illustrates the essential difference between Mordechai and Haman. Haman is required to honor Mordechai and he accepts his fate obediently, despite the difficult position put upon him. ויאמר המלך להמן, מהר קח את הלבוש ואת הסוס כאשר דיברת, ועשה כן למרדכי היהודי. Quickly, take the robes and the horse as you have said, and do so to the Jew מרדכי. And המן did it. ויקח המן את הלבוש ואת הסוס וילבש את מרדכי. המן took the robes and the horse and robed מרדכי. המן was the most important minister in the king's court. Sarah, I think you need to... Yeah, yeah, it's my last, last yeah. sentence. Yeah. <laughs> But it's okay. But he had lacked the mental capacity to refuse the king's decree. He took the robes and the horse and robed Mordechai. Mordechai, on the other hand, refuses to accept the king's edict when it goes against his own conscience. He was unwilling to accept the king's decree when, he conf- and when it conflicted with his faith. Mordechai lo ichra. So in the ear, uh, horse incident, we see Haman's obedience in contrasted with Mordechai's resolve. Mordechai emerges victorious with his integrity in the battle of wheels. The incident of the king's horse is an indicator as to withstanding this test of character and faith. And just to sum up the discussion, I think um, we can see that the incident of the, hor- of the king's horse This is the most important episode in the Megillah and serves a dual purpose. It assists a stir plan to save the Jews and also explain why the Jews merited to be saved because of their mental capacity to refuse a king of flesh and blood, Melech Basar Vadam, remain devoted to their faith and maintain their free will. I wish everybody Purim Sameach. Thank you very much for listening. Toda raba, Sarah, thank you very much. That was a wonderful literary analysis of the Megillah. Thank you. Especially the, the chart at the beginning and at the end was very helpful to see the chiasm, the structure of the Megillah, and the central episode about uh, that uh, the king could not sleep. <laughs>